Yeah, g'day here, and gentlemen, and welcome to this old lathe channel. We've been working on modernizing this old 1982 Schaublin 125 CNC lathe. This week, I need to start planning my user control module or control panel, and I'm going to need your help for a sanity check on the layout. Now this is not my first rodeo because I already did the controllers for my CNC mini lathe and for my Maho 400 milling machine. I've got a mix of things which I really like and things which I'd do differently if I'm doing them again. So let's run through quickly the things that I like. Starting with, I use this GMockerPy interface. Linux CNC's got a number of different interfaces you can choose. This one was programmed by a German gentleman by the name of Norbert. He did a fantastic job. I believe it somewhat models similar sort of behavior that you get in Heidenheim controllers in that it's very modal. So based on the mode you choose on the right hand side, the options along the bottom change. So whether you're in jogging mode, which means you've got all the like touch off and tool setting and stuff like that. When you're running a program down here, you'll then have, you know, your, your cycle start, stop, single block feed, M1 overrides and all that stuff. I really like GMockerPy. On this machine, I duplicated the soft keys with physical buttons. I really like that. I'm going to do that again. I think it's a good good solution. I thought I'd do everything on the touchscreen. In practice, it's nice to have a keyboard as well. So I've got a like a carrier for a keyboard. It works quite well. But I think on the next machine, I will integrate a keyboard into it. Having encoders to, to select jog speed override or feed rate override and to reset it with a button in the middle is fantastic. I really like that. Also the e-stop, I like the down in that lower left hand position close to the machine. I definitely like having the USB ports on here so I can easily plug in a USB stick with a G-code program and load it from there. That works well. Because of the hot key, but because I duplicated the hotkeys, I don't feel a great need to add an additional feed rate hold or single line button dedicated to the controller because you've already got that as a physical key. So what about the mini lathe? This time, because of the general size of the machine, I went for a very compact controller. I again went for a touchscreen, this time a more modern one with a bit of viewing angle. Once again, USB port and the e-stop are in logical places for me. Super useful. I'll probably put two on again next time. I'm glad I used a physical keyboard. I find that more convenient than using the small on-screen buttons for typing in numbers and G-codes, so that, that's good. Whereas the Maho's got a separate pendant, I went for an integrated pendant on the lathe, which I do think makes sense. What I don't like so much about this module which I did is that this is a pretty old touchscreen with a pretty poor viewing angle. The screen being vertical and quite low, it's not a comfortable viewing angle for me. I should have either tilted it back slightly or raised it up higher to my eye level. And the second thing, I have these provisions to hold the portable keyboard. So that works well. In practice, I use the keyboard all the time, so I should have just integrated a proper keyboard into it. I designed this head unit out of three millimeter steel plate, and because it's laser cut, I made it self-fixturing. It was very easy to weld. Then I just ground down all the welds, made it look nice. Uh, it's solid as, but I like that. It gives a really nice feel to it. I'll do that again. And there's a huge access panel on the back, which is also very helpful whenever I need to do it, get in there and change things in the wiring. So what don't I like about the lathe's control panel? I think the monitor's a bit too small. All the writing's kind of tiny and my eyesight's not getting any better with age. So a bigger monitor is definitely better for me. The way I did this jogging where I can select between axes and they share the same jog encoder turns out to be a pretty unintuitive interface for me. I feel like I'm always in the wrong position, never know which way I need to turn the wheel. So that is suboptimal for a lathe in my opinion. So I definitely don't want to do that again. The increment selection, that works fine. As you can see, because the machine's in e-stop at the moment, that just causes an error. Not having duplicated the physical soft keys around the monitor means I have to start programs and stop programs directly on the touchscreen. Not such a fan. Should have put the soft keys on this machine as well. Oh, hey, I saw this at work this week. 
On a previous video, I think I showed you a deployed thrust reverser on a CFM. Well, this is what it looks like on an RB211. Once the translating sleeve, which you can see out the aircraft window, deploys, it pulls in on those blocker doors, shutting off the bypass air, forcing the air out the cascade vanes. So that's what we're up to first. By the way, next week, I'll be doing my next Patreon and members live stream. I do them roughly once a month, just doing a variety of topics, things that interest me. Sometimes it's project updates, bit of a forecast of projects to come. If you're a long time viewer of the channel, please join and come and check it out. Now, as you can see at the moment, I've just got the monitor sitting loose here and controllers just lying around. Shoblin used to have a big, huge box up here with all the control in it. And I think I'm going to mount my control in the same location. Now, since I'm not great at throwing stuff out, I've actually still got that box that had the original controller in it. It measured 70 by 55 by 50 centimeters. While that Schaublin control panel is not much use to me anymore, except maybe as a source of some sheet metal. I also kept the control head from the Maho. I'm starting to see this as a pretty good basis for the new Schaublin control panel and head unit. Once this monitor's freed of the, all the plastic housing, I'm guessing that the actual screen is probably around maybe 36 by 30 centimeters, which would be tight if I want uh, soft keys on the side of it. I need to pull it out of that plastic to see how big it really is. So the keyboard I bought looks like it'll fit quite nicely. There's plenty of space at the bottom for additional buttons and features like my e-stop and all of the other things I'm gonna need to control directly. This is also an enormous housing which I assume I'll be able to cut down some space off the back and maybe even shorten this area. Having learnt my lesson, trying to horn all the electrics into this control cabinet which I reduced in size by more than half, I'll probably hold off on cutting this down until I've got a better idea of where everything fits within it. This is the original Schaublin pillar which carries the head unit and it mounts very securely over here at the back of the lathe. And there's even the stop block to stop it rotating, which was never going to happen with the three big M12 bolts anyway, but hey, belt and suspenders, I guess. So as a first rough look at this, need to come up a little higher, probably shorter, definitely shorter at the back. Is that too high to operate a keyboard? I'd say it'll work for me. The machine's currently up on blocks, so it's standing higher than it normally would. Now this here is the original tray which the old controller sat on. Okay, so it definitely went back further. Came out roughly the same distance. I'll need to cut all of these interface components off and weld them onto the bottom of this one. Now before I get too carried away with planning to use that old Maho cabinet, I better pull this monitor out first and see if there's actually space around it to fit a set of soft keys. Okay, so that really doesn't look that promising because it's also 38 centimeters down there. How does it look when you actually fit it? Hmm. Yeah, now there's no space around that. I don't know. I think I might go looking for a different screen solution. Okay, I had a look online and it looks like a 14 inch touch screen will probably fit better, giving me the space on this side for the soft keys. And then of course a row along the bottom as well. I thought I wasn't a big fan of the 16x9 format, but then I looked on the mini lathe where I've got it and it actually doesn't bother me. I don't notice it. So the advantage too of that means I could chop down this top a bit, take some volume out of this whole head unit, where I also don't have a huge amount of space by the wall. Now I said keyboard at the top, but having seen how high this cabinet's gonna actually sit above the floor, it's probably gonna be better to put the keyboard lower so I don't have to reach in quite so far to use it. I'll probably cut this Ford strip off. Don't really want it to be sticking out that much. Then again, if I'm gonna start chopping the cabinet and doing a whole bunch of welding, I'm gonna to have to take all the paint off it. And if I end up cutting down both the height 
and the depth, that's really quite a lot of welding. The steel which Maho used on their control cabinet is only two millimeters by the looks of it, which is gonna be a bit touch and go for me to stick weld. Whereas if I made a new one, I could use three millimeters, which, go, which works fine. But then there's the question of what other physical buttons do I need? Now, obviously e-stop's gonna be number one, or as the Dutch like to call it, the nude stop. I'm going to need three encoders. I think this one's probably going to be feed override. I don't need a 100% feed rate override button because that's going to be the center of the encoder. And then the rest will be for buttons. Now cycle stop, uh, feed hold, single step. I've already got as physical buttons once I do the soft keys here. So I don't really need to repeat them. Although there is a temptation to have a dedicated pause button next to the feed rate over override. I'll have to have a think about that. So what I'm thinking here is a spindle counterclockwise spindle off Spindle clockwise, coolant, coolant's off, mist. Not sure if I ever actually do this, but it's kind of nice to have the provision. I'm gonna need collet clamping. I'm gonna need a tail stock, extend and retract. All these spindle and coolant buttons are only available on touch, so that's why I definitely wanna move them down here. These are functions that are specific to the to the to the shell blend. Not sure what else I would actually need. Now, what I'm not looking at putting on here are jogging buttons. And the reason for that is there's a bar which bolts along the front of the lathe here, which I cannot for the life of me find at the moment. It's, uh, yeah, I've got it hidden somewhere in my chaos. No, wait, I found it. It was just hiding under a big layer of dust. So this bar, which the whole sort of cover thing slides on, I was gonna use that. Basically the idea, we mount this sort of pendanty device onto this bar, have it be able to move but also clamp, and have dedicated encoders for jogging X and Z, so I can jog the machine around, similar to how you would jog a manual machine. Might be best to have this as a rotary switch for the jog increment selection. One other thing I'm quite unsure about is whether to put a single push button for selecting the next tool on the tool changer. Now, there is a pneumatic switch for that. In some ways it seems redundant to be able to do it electrically as well. One of my thoughts is if I do it electrically, I'll probably never use this control. And then you've got the danger of the whole the mechanism gumming up. On the other hand, there might be good reasons to have it on the machine. But then again, there could be good reason to have either next tool button here on the control panel, or even like Shaw Blend did it with a, like a selector where you can tell it to go straight to whatever, go straight from tool number one to tool number four. The other thing I was sort of thinking about was one of those like four position joysticks you know, maybe using that for jogging. Don't know, what are your thoughts on four position joystick jogging on a lathe? It's the way Schaublin did it, but it seems a bit clunky to me. Seems like it'd be nicer to do that with jog encoders. To interface all these buttons into Linux CNC, I'm gonna be using a Mesa 7i73 card. It's kind of a cute little device. I can either do a four by eight matrix of keys, so 32 keys available, or even an eight by eight giving me 64 keys, and also, read out a few encoders, and the whole thing then communicates with Linux CNC with a single Cat6 cable. Very nice little device. It's only a $50 card, but it does an awful lot. It saves a huge amount of wiring. Now I'm gonna to need to order that monitor, and I'm gonna be on a business trip next week, so I probably won't get much done anyway, but I would like you guys' feedback. What do you think of this control layout? Especially you guys have got experience with sort of tool room CNC lathes. I'd really appreciate your feedback. Which way would you go? Paint strip, hack and weld this one, or start from a fresh uh, slate and make a new one. Now this has also been on the board for weeks. My spindle's not reversing. I need to find out why the clockwise, counterclockwise pins not functioning. But luckily I did a wiring diagram. So I know that this pin here is ground, and that orange should be like clockwise pin high, counterclockwise pin low. From a wiring diagram, I know that those two wires come up through the terminals 35 and 36. So I can do a continuity check to here. 
They're connected. 35 should just go to ground. Which it does. 36 should go up to my I.O. board at pin 18. Okay, now I'm looking for the Hell Show because I should be connected here to the 7i84 the output output number one that already answers the why it's not working it's not connected to anything now if we look at the machine's hell file so what did I connect this to so I'm turning it on and off with line 50 I'm giving it a speed with line 48 but I haven't connected the clock uh, clockwise counterclockwise to an output pin and that's why it's not changing direction I did a bit of a search in the Linux CNC documentation so Linux CNC's core components generate a couple of spindle pins one of which is spindle reverse and there's another one for spindle forward they're currently not connected to anything so what I've done is connected the spindle reverse pin to a new signal which I created called spindle direction and then that spindle direction signal I send out to that output of my Mesa card so now let's see if it actually works they're both off Now if I go spindle back, they should be both be on. Okay, so that's working, but the spindle's still turning in the wrong direction. I'll need to have a think about that. Check the voltmeter with the voltmeter to make sure that that pin is being sent high. So I should have zero volts, that's correct. Now if I go into reverse. So that means my Mesa card is correctly configured and giving a correct output. It's making a 5 volt signal. I'm just wondering, maybe the problem is that it needs a 24 volt input signal. I have both 5 volt and 24 volt I.O. And this is currently being signaled with a, with, from a 5 volt I.O. Low is under 3 volts but high is 12 to 30 so that means it must be a 24 volt nominal system yeah I put it on the wrong terminal block so I'd already corrected that just with a piece of felt pen let me take this uh, label off and relabel it properly because it's supposed to be on terminal block 2 which is my 24 volt rail Okay, so now I've moved that from output number one onto output number nine. Now when I start Linux CNC, let me just uh, home this again. So spindle forward. Spindle reverse. All right. Works just like I bought one. Now the really important thing to do is to modify my wiring diagram to reflect that change. Mesa output number 9, pin 18 on terminal block 2, down through terminal 36, to my VFD, from the terminal E4, and terminal 39 through pin 35 to ground. Well thanks a lot for sticking around till the end. It was a long video with a lot of talking. Uh, to Heather, sorry there were no sparks and there's no swarf. Maybe next time when I start chopping. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.